Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. I am Jay Baer from Convince and Convert. This is Marketing Mix Modeling Mythbusters. Should you use MMM? You'll hear us say MMM a lot because it's a lot faster to say than Marketing Mix Modeling. Should you use MMM to inform your next media plan? Well, the question is, is already been answered. It is yes, but we're going to tell you why that's true uh, here today. You are probably familiar with the uh, erstwhile show, Mythbusters, an incredible show, uh, one of my all-time favorites, no longer on the air, but uh, was formative in my own appreciation for the way things work. And we're going to take that same kind of approach to today's session. We've assembled a similar panel. I guess we're one we one person short. Uh, we're one short. Uh, mm. We don't have we don't have Tory. Maybe it's, a, it's a, we got most everybody else. Today's MMM MythBusters. Myself, Jay Bear, founder of Convince and Convert. Dan, tell them about yourself. Hi everybody. My name is Dan Temby, uh, out of Toronto, and uh, I'm uh, responsible for all of our technology and analytics. Uh, practice areas within the agency. I've been with DC uh, just gone 15 years, but I've been in this industry for close to 25 since uh, the early days of commercial internet clicking and so on. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here, Jenna. Hey there, I'm Jenna Watson. I run our media team, which includes all digital paid media and SEO. I'm situated in Chicago and I've been with DAC for about six years, worked in digital agencies my entire career, almost as long as Dan, but He's the old man in the crew here. I think I'm the old man in the crew, but I appreciate that. There. Uh, <laughs> Gavin. Hi, I'm Gavin Bowick. I work at DAC in our UK office. I've been with DAC for just over four years now, uh, having come out of a background of first research science and then marketing management. And I'm moving more on into web analytics and data science. We're going to get a little data science here today, Gavin. Thank you so much for being here. Friends, just a quick uh, reminder, if you've got sort of a generalized comment, put it in the chat. If you have an actual question you'd like us to address, please put it in the Q&A. You can find both of those at the bottom there, uh, presumably, in your Zoom control panel. Speaking of questions, yes, we want them. Please uh, ask as many questions as you like. We will address as many as we can. If there's any we can't get to, we will address them off air and uh, send them to you in the follow-up email that you're going to get. Uh, we are going to record this session. We are, in fact, recording this session right now, and we will share the recording with you uh, post-conclusion of today's event. Also, there is a very swell MMM white paper uh, authored by DAC in, uh, in conjunction with AdAge, breaking down the myths of marketing mixed modeling. Uh, we're going to share that with you as well. So you're going to get the recording. You'll get some additional questions if there are some, and you're going to get the white paper. All that will come to you in a nice little package in the days to come. All right, let's get right into it. Why, why are we here? Well, We've been struggling with this idea of, you know, remember John Wanamaker said um, 70, 80 years ago that he knows that half of his money is wasted on marketing, just isn't sure which half. Still true today in many cases. So we've been talking about marketing mix as a way to get better at business since 1953. The term marketing mix was coined by Neil Borden all the way back. That's 80 years ago, if my math is, no, 70 years ago, my job, that's why I'm not in analytics. Uh, <laughs> 70 years ago by Neil Morden. And only now have we decided to do a webinar about it. It took us 70 years to get a webinar together, uh, but it is an incredibly important topic. So what is it? Well, marketing mix modeling, or MMM, as you'll hear us uh, call it today, uses analysis of sales and marketing data to estimate the revenue impact of different marketing activities and different channel choices. So spend how much, where, spend this much there, et cetera. Uh, how does that work together to improve your business outcomes? You also hear this called media mix modeling sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, for purposes of today's session, we're going to call it marketing mix modeling. But for all of our convenience, we're typically going to call it MMM. But why is this important? What, what are the benefits of, of MMM? Well, in theory, you use it to predict the impact of marketing efforts and to be able to make changes that are intelligent and also quicker than changes you could make without MMM. Does, Dan, does that, does that ring true for you? Yeah, sure it does, uh, Jay. There's, um, you know, uh, Currently, everyone's looking for any signal we can get, any in, any insight or a point of view or an opinion um, to help make better choices. Uh, and it really is uh, one of the, the, the strongest signals we can use when we're trying to decide where these valuable media do dollars are going to go. 
Um, we say often, and you'll probably see that in the white paper, that analytics is, you know, the general practice of analytics is about being incrementally less wrong. Um, you know, no one knows what's going to happen in the future. We use everything we know about the past to help inform it as best we can. Uh, so this concept of how do we become less ignorant to what the truth is, less wrong and, and closer to truth. We'll never get it perfect, but we'll always be better off. And these, these mechanisms can be very powerful in, uh, in helping guide those choices. Love that. Jenna or Gavin, anything to add there? I just think, you know, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later. You'll see a lot about this, but this is an excellent tool in measurement. Uh, it, it is a way to measure. And I think you're going to hear a lot of distinction that might be new or might be a nuance that you haven't heard uh, recently between things like attribution, MMM, um, forecasting. You're going to hear all of that today. Uh, so I think, you know, some of those nuances are what's critical. And I think what maybe some marketers uh, trip over. So I'll just yeah. tee that up a little bit. Some of the key advantages in theory of MMM are optimizing your targeting, uh, being more efficient with your marketing advertising spend, and then overall return on investment will drill down on those. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the reality is that for some, MMM can also be a little bit challenging. We'll explore this today. Um, you have to have data to make sense of the data. So the availability of data can be a challenge. Um, complexity of attribution can be a challenge. You know, what do you have to know to do this? That is sometimes viewed as potentially an obstacle. And, and then how much does it cost to, to be incrementally less wrong? Uh, and is it worth it? Uh, so we'll talk about all of those today. Uh, so how do we think about this in the real world? So when I, who am not an analytics professional, consider something like MMM, I, I fall back on a sports analogy. So in basketball, there is a statistic called PER, which stands for Player Efficiency Rating. It's a relatively new uh, stat used in advanced basketball analysis. And what it purports to do is investigate each player's total contribution to game outcomes. So it's points, it's rebounds, it's steals, it's assists, it's free throws, it's missed free throws, it's missed shots, it's fouls, um, it's defensive position. It's sort of an all-in-one metric that says, is this person good or not as good at basketball? So you see here, this is this year's Phoenix Suns lineup uh, and how much each of those people are paid to play basketball. This is uh, fortunately or unfortunately, my favorite NBA team. On the right-hand side there, you'll see in yellow the PER column. So Devin Booker, uh, one of the Sun stars, his PER is 28.7. Uh, just by way of context, 14 is an average NBA performance. So 28.7 is, is very good indeed. So there's a lot of nuance inside this number, inside 28.7. But what it helps you do is say, all right, on the whole, who on this list is better at basketball uh, and how much do they get paid accordingly? This is kind of how MMM works. Now, Dan, you are uh, far more athletically inclined in terms of participation than I am, as they tell by the size of our heads uh, on <laughs> the video. But please tell, us, I'm six foot eight. Yeah. Your, your, <laughs> please tell us your analogy of, uh, of how MMM works as well. Well, yeah, and we've we've uh, communicating complex topics to to everybody in a really understandable way is a big part of the job, and we've come in in and out of a, a number of them. But the one that seems to land is this concept of sort of mac macro nutritional uh, sustenance. My wife is actually a professional fitness trainer and a nutritionist, and so she this really made sense to her as well when we when we spoke through it. And um, your basketball analogy is excellent, uh, and it and it tracks rather well. Um, save for one difference is that every player and every team has the same goal. They all want to win the NBA championship. I, you know, as, as far as, you know, running a successful business, all of our clients have very different goals because they're doing different things. They're selling different services. They're selling different products. They're seeking different outcomes. Uh, and they're all very nuanced in, in their own particular way. So we think about that. We look at, you know, individual human beings and their nutritional goals, regardless of whether, um, they're a weightlifter or a runner or a marathon, uh, a marathon runner or a competitive athlete or just a normal person trying to stay in shape, the best shape that they can. Um, this idea of macro nutritional distribution of proteins, carbs, and fats is a really tight analogy. Um, Gavin, you worked on this one a little bit. Maybe you could take that a little further for me. Yeah, so I think what we were really trying to, to put into a easily, excuse the pun, digestible context here was this idea was that 
people have different objectives and they can have different body types and different met um, metabolism. But what they really want to get to is a makeup of those macronutrients that work for them, for their body type and help them achieve their objectives. It may well be that for one particular person, that's 40% from carbs, 40% from fats, 20% from proteins. From another, for another person, it might be uh, flipped like that. What an MMM does is the same type of idea with the objective being your lead generation or your footfall or your revenue generation with those macronutrients replaced by your media spends across those different channels. Now with your macronutrients, you arrive at that percentage, overall percentage split across those groups. And the same is true of MMM. It's not about, it's about finding that top level place to be and that budget split at the, the high level. So much like your macronutrients, you arrive on a percentage split for where those calories are going to come from, but it doesn't tell you what you should have for breakfast and whether or not you should have your protein shake an hour after your workout. Those are the more tactical and nuanced types of um, things that you'd obviously want to, to move into. But mm -hmm. MMM gives you that global, where is about the right place that I need to be? So I've got that context and then I can start focusing on what is the best, the granular breakdown uh, of how to consume those. Fantastic. We've talked about the session being called Mythbusters, so it would be a little bit uh, a shame if we didn't actually dispel some myths. So let's roll those out for you. First, we're going to start off with a little poll here. Uh, here is the first one. Uh, friends who are participating, uh, we would love for you to uh, participate in this poll. The question is this, how similar are MMM and attribution modeling? How similar are MMM and attribution modeling? Some of you may not be certain, but go ahead and uh, take a stab at it and, and we'll see what we get here. Thanks for the participation. The votes are rolling um, in, as they say. It's fun. I feel like I'm in the matrix, Jake. I know. It's, it's very fun to watch these coming in. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great. All right. I'll give you a couple more seconds. All right, that's close enough. Uh, we will end the poll. We will share the results. Uh, and the results are these. 42% uh, of you, the, uh, the, the leading vote getter, says that they are similar. Uh, second place is dissimilar. Yeah. Ha, how about that? So, yeah. so MMM is either similar or dissimilar. To <laughs> one, of the, one of those two. <laughs> Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more. Um, is is going to be the uh, is going to be the that's fantastic. Call. That's maybe the best result we could have hoped for. It's fantastic. Yeah. So so the myth here is that is that MMM is attribution modeling, and and it in fact is it is not. Um, Dan, uh, kick us off on this, and then pass it around the panel if you would on this notion of attribution versus contribution. Sure. And uh, again, you know, there's there's so much we could talk for an hour just on this one topic. I was reminded a few days ago as I was just contemplating today of a uh, of an anecdote that I, from about eight years ago I was, I was presenting at a conference uh, and I did a quick poll of the audience and I said, "Okay, everybody, how many people here are using Google Analytics?" And everybody put their hand up. You know, the whole room put their hand up, more or less. And I said, "Okay, keep your hand up if uh, your business has an attribution model." And ninety percent of the hands went right down and uh, uh, sparse hands. Stay, stayed up. Um, and I said, well, actually, that's not true. If you're using Google Analytics, you have, have an attribution it. model. It's just maybe not a very good one. And it's maybe very default because an attribution model seeks to award specific value to every single digital interaction that a human being took between the beginning and the end of their purchase journey with you. Um, where we're trying to award that credit for the division of the value. Um, media mix modeling or marketing mix modeling in a very similar way. If you're spending money on more than one media activity, then you have a media mix model. It just might not be a very good one. You might be doing it anecdotally or instinctively or relying on the smarts of people or their experiences, um, but really uh, it's happening. And again, back to this idea of being incrementally less wrong, how can we enhance that and do do more with it and, and take it a step further to, to become more insightful. 
the different, the biggest difference between those two things, even though everyone is still doing them, is attribution tracking every single interaction at the human level, and then media mix modeling being this contribution concept. So I'll let Gavin really explain, uh, you know, his definition of contribution. Yeah, well, I was going to say my, I, I did love to see what that poll result looked like because I think that similar and dissimilar at the same time uh, is pretty much how I see MMM. I think as digital marketers, we have this idea of attribution is the type of thing that if, if you've used Google Analytics and looked at the top conversion pads and the model comparison tool, which is what we're looking at here, then this is how in the digital world we seem to have used the term attribution. So there are a number of articles out there about you should use MMM or attribution modeling. I would make an argument from a semantic standpoint that you're still trying to, MMM is still in some way attribution. You're just trying to attribute the contribution of a particular channel to what ended up happening here. So I think the fact that we had those two answers, it'd be very interesting to know how that is reflected and just how people interpret the use of those words versus whether or not the term attribution modeling has now, particularly when we get into multi-touch time attribution mm -hmm. ideals, how much of that, that word now has been usurped and just taken over by this type of digital click-based journey. And I think one of the very interesting things here, and particularly it's a big driver, I think, for the shift to MMM, is we're looking at click-based journeys when we start looking at these models within GA. So if somebody sees a print ad and then thinks, oh, that's an interesting product, Googles it, generic term, clicks, comes back, sees your brand having, you know, then come back on a branded paid search, that initial traditional media that might have sparked the curiosity in the first place won't be accredited here. Mm -hmm. And as we see, if we start looking even just within that digital attribution clickstream based sense, if we start to change our attribution model from away from Google Analytics default, then we do start to see shifts in what those numbers look like. But I think the one of the big drivers of this, and I think we'll talk about this later, is as we move to more of a privacy first world, the amount of those user journeys that we're able to track is continually being eroded. Yeah. And what does that do in terms of potentially biasing particular channels against people that opt in and give consent? Uh, I think there are, are questions there. So I think that's something we'll, we'll talk about in, in future myths, but that idea of, yes, we're looking at how does each channel contribute overall and working together to drive that response metric. I think that working together, that working together nuance is important, Gavin. I think it's, you know, not, not looking at each channel or each spend in isolation, but in combination, uh, you know, what is the outcome? I think that's a, a big difference here. Uh, and you see that a little bit here on, uh, on this graph. You want to uh, describe this for us? Yeah, so here's, I think, two of the outputs that um, people that looked at MMM um, before might be familiar with. So this idea of, if you look at the chart on this waterfall chart on the left-hand side, as we start to look at the contribution of different channels, uh, and we can also start to bring in external variables or uh, events, trade shows, holidays, seasonality, competitor activity of those data are available, you can start to see, well, here's a contribution of where we would currently expect to hit in terms of this is where we are with our brand equity that we've built up over the years. And as we add these additional channels, they're producing a marginal contribution above that. Uh, and then there might be some other uh, impacts such as maybe macro consumer confidence or competitor activity that brings that back down again. So overall, we're able to break down the relative contribution and percentage terms for the revenue period that we're, we're looking at. Looking at on the, the right-hand side, obviously, a simple thought experiment to say if you spend a hundred thousand dollars in a channel in one week and you achieve a particular return on that spend that will not continue indefinitely you can't then spend 
a million dollars in a week and expect to see a completely linear growth because otherwise we'd all just do that. <laughs> so one of the things we need to look at is that law of diminishing returns and those we start to model statistically as those saturation curves and we can see that the shapes of those can vary from channel to channel. So really what we want to understand is where is the point on that curve for each channel that is a good place to be based on historical data, obviously, because that's how we build these models, but also looking forwards as to what the objectives for the next quarter, the next year, the next two years may be. Are there new media channels appearing? Is the objective shifting away from efficiency and more towards growth, for example? So, but these give us a, a benchmark based on previous performance in where we can start to inform our media planning for, for future periods. Okay, time for another poll, friends. Let's get into the second one here, which is, I believe, this one. If you were trying to figure out how much money to spend or whether to spend, et cetera, what would you use for that? Would you uh, look at prior budgets, previous return on ad spend, projections from, from maybe uh, sales reps or, or customer service fund, friends from a media company, or would you try to use MMM? We're forcing you to pick only one here. The answer is probably multiple of these, but uh, as a thought exercise, we are going to make you pick one and let's see what our participants say. All right, the votes continue to roll in. This one is also fun. I feel like this is great. wonders if we're changing hearts and minds to already in this <laughs> webinar to get so many people saying MMM. Next, <laughs> we'll time, we're, next time we're just doing polls. It's going to be great. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. Just a whole, a whole hour of polls. A whole session of yeah. polls. <laughs> right. Once again, it's a split decision. Uh, ROAS uh, wins the day at 45%. Return ad spend 45%. Second, though, MMM. I feel pretty good about that. I don't know if we've biased the jury, as Jenna said, or or uh, or we have a lot of uh, MMM fans who signed up for the webinar. But either way, that is pretty interesting. So the second myth that we hear a lot is that MMM actually tells you how to spend money or where to spend money or how much money to spend, and that's not exactly right. Um, you know, MMM is not necessarily the tool you need to to you know calculate the most accurate spend. It's not really for that. There's other things that you can use. Jenna, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think so. This is kind of what I was speaking about earlier on in, in the webinar is there's all these nuances between attribution and forecasting in MMM. And I think what we're talking about here is what you what most people who just answered return on ad spend to that question what you're used to seeing is a forecast most of the time. So you're going from the impressions to the click-through rate to get to the clicks, to the conversion rate, to get to the number of conversions, to the revenue attached to that, to get down to your ROAS. And that is all based on available data from your program that you have run in the past, combined with expectations of what you would expect for your media to do. The problem with that is it's only going to be based on what you've done before. So a lot of the things that Gavin just showed about competitive, um, competitive interference or macro factors, or let's even think about new things that might not have existed before, all of those are going to change your ability to understand where to spend money. So for example, if you just think about your spend on the Google platform only, for example, if we looked at this and we didn't used to have performance mix in our mix because it never existed before, and now we do, that's going to be a different line item and it's going to change what the media mix model will tell you versus what a forecast will tell you, right? So the forecast is more of a bottom up sort of view. And that's where you're going to look at your ROAS and you're going to look at those kind of channel and tactic level details for performance. The media mix model aims to bring it all together and tell you this is the correct distribution of where you should be placing your dollars. So they are different tools used for different reasons. Love that. Thank you so much, Jen. That's terrific. Um, so what we've talked about a little bit here, and we'll just put a finer point on it, is that what MMM helps you do is determine how channels and media types work together, right? It's, right. it's that, that collaboration that we're trying to find insight on, not so much how does paid search work? Like we've got tools for that. Right. Or, or how does display ads work? We got tools for that. But how does an incremental change in display ads 
affect paid search and how do they work together, sort of a one plus one equals three from a math standpoint, that's what we're trying to uncover with, with MMM, which can be incredibly valuable in terms of being incrementally less wrong, uh, as Dan likes to say. A third myth though, and I think this is really uh, appropriate sequencing, it, and I've heard this myself, people say, well, yeah, that's cool. And, you know, Gavin, it's got some fancy charts, but it's more like interesting, not really actionable. It's more like, well, ah, cool. I guess I would rather know that than not know that, but I can't actually do anything with this to improve my business. The myth is that this is essentially uh, an intellectual exercise, not a practical exercise. That is the myth. And it is also true that because this requires a lot of data and a lot of data across mm -hmm. channels, because again, the idea is how do the channels work together, that that, that much data and, and juggling it and organizing it and sequencing it can be a lot. Like it's, you know, it's a, it's a big sandwich uh, to consume. True, mm -hmm. fully true. But let's look at a poll. Let's ask you this question which is, uh, let's see, is it up there? No. No. Oh, no. Man, hold on. Did I not end the other one? Let's see, that's why. There we go. Okay, we should be able to uh, answer this one now. How expensive is it to implement and use MMM? How expensive is it? Now, what is very expensive to you versus inexpensive, hard to say, but we're gonna make you pick a descriptor. Is it very expensive, expensive, neutral, inexpensive, or very inexpensive? Mm. Let's see if we get the same kind of bifurcation as we've had in the previous two polls. All right, looks like most of the folks who tend to vote, oh, we got even more voters this time. Yeah. I like this. Yes, our response rate is going up. I'm not uh, in the analytics business, but Gavin, I think that's good news, right? <laughs> up, yeah, up, up, up sounds good in this case. Yep. Yeah, excellent. Yes. Yeah. Where this is our, our record number of voters. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, the results are these. Wow, it's almost a split decision. Uh, the the uh, highest ranking answer is expensive. Uh, inexpensive is, <laughs> as of course, inexpensive is second, and and I don't really know uh, is is third. Uh, all right. So yes, it's, it can be, it cannot be. We're going to uh, look into that right now. Hold on just a second. I think I've, there we go. Great. Okay. So the, the myth is that it is, is too expensive, right? That, that it is too expensive. Um, so in concert with, with the previous um, question that it is not actionable, Gavin, I want you to address this. Um, I, I first take the actionability part, and then we'll talk about the expense part. I think the actionability one is a very interesting question in that I think so much of it is really driven by organizationally and culturally and even philosophically how you approach what you're going to do with it. If it's been done as a box ticking exercise so that we can say, we've yeah. done an MMM, we're, we're a data driven organization now. It's that, well, you might be a data using organization, but I think until you start to action that, maybe there's a disconnect between data using and data driven. If, however, there's a culture that says, we want to embrace what is available. We have a huge resource in terms of the data that we have built up over the years across multiple platforms. We want to start seeing some value from that beyond simply using it to build a dashboard to say this is how well we did last month and it was slightly better than we did the month before it's about becoming predictive rather than just looking at here's how we did so the actionability is really critical for this and i think the way we've started to talk about this uh, internally and with our clients is that it isn't just a case of here are the two charts we looked at before or here's a normalized ROAS figure across those different channels, there's some information that you might find interesting. It's about, okay, who do we need to put these data in front of? How does this inform what we do next? What's the media expertise that needs to go in here? 
how does this fit with what the subject matter experts, the people who've been working on these accounts, uh, have been, uh, what they've been able to conclude from looking at the raw data in platforms as they've been managing these campaigns for the last two years? Mm -hmm. Just to consider that MMM in isolation, I think ignores a lot of that context and a lot of that expertise. As Jenna mentioned earlier with this, this idea of maybe you weren't doing Pmax two years ago and then the last six months you were. So not if you just build a model on the last two years of data, maybe you've completely changed how you have gone from manual bidding to automated bidding strategies. So all of those types of inputs add additional context. And I think really that MMM isn't a, here's some charts, go away and have fun with them. It's here's some charts. What do these mean to you? What right. what do you agree? And what looks good to you? What doesn't quite sit right? And then I think most importantly, how do we test that? Right. The, for me, the main actionability is how do we develop hypotheses to see if moving the needle slightly on some of those optimized budget numbers mm -hmm. actually drive incremental lift when we put it to the test. Right. If I could build on that just very quickly, Jay, because I think it's a really important point, and there's a reason why the third and fourth myths are so you so connected: the lack of actionability and the perception of being too expensive. <clears throat> in in my career and the hundreds of data projects I've been involved in, the ones that that have failed, and some of them do, are primarily due to due to what Gavin is talking about. Um, it's not just MMM, take any analytics or data science project, understanding why you're doing it and what you're ready and willing and able to do differently at the end of it before you even touch a single keyboard and move towards an outcome is critical. Because if everyone's not ready to go with saying, this is what we're going to do once we've, we've found our, um, we, we, we have our insight or we have our hypotheses, then it just does become an extremely expensive reporting exercise, which you don't need data science people for or you simply need some people that understand how to use Excel. Um, so those, the perceptions of that are critical. You know, we often talk about Bob as this, you know, generic figure for the person that's been at an organization for 20 years and knows everything. And our job is to sort of be better than Bob. We have to know more or argue or confirm what Bob thinks or um, refute it uh, appropriately and formulate something that we can go in action and test. So I think as part of any data science project, MMM is no exception that you need a clear understanding of what you're going to actually do differently when you have your insight so that you can validate your findings and improve business outcomes overall. And that means, you know, going from, and we, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but going into incrementality testing and designing experiments to validate your findings in a controlled way so that you can have confidence to make the big calls uh, and make decisions just as you would, you know, just as you would hire an experienced business person to sit on your board and give insight and guidance to your business, consider what we're doing here is very similar. It's a yeah. board seat member that is gonna give insight and guidance to you and help you grow and drive your business appropriately. They're not gonna be a unilateral you know, decision maker that, 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 that gets listened to above all else, but it's gonna be a voice that needs to be listened to. Yeah, I love that analogy of the board member. That's, that's really great, uh, fantastic. Jenna, anything to add there? I just think it, the, the idea that anything is too expensive is a very subjective thing, right? So to Gavin and Dan's point, if this is something that can truly change the outcomes of your business, how expensive is too ex expensive, right? And it's also a little bit of how long is a piece of string too. So right. this doesn't have to be the only thing. We've already talked about attribution. We've talked about forecasting. We've talked about now MMM as part of that mix. So it doesn't have to be the only thing. It doesn't have to be the one all in megalithic way that you look at your business. But if this is something that can truly show you a different way to go to market in terms of where your money is going, is that not worth it to make improvements to your bottom line? So I think, you know, it's a very subjective, expensive is a very subjective thing here, but in the actual real dollars, it also doesn't have to be super, super expensive either. So I think, you know, we'll talk about a little bit more of that too. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick question here from Michael, um, who asks, what is your opinion on measuring the long-term effect of advertising, which may fall outside a classic MMM model, but I think it's a, a good, place to introduce the question. 
Um, we, we looked at sort of forecasted uh, response tracking over time. Uh, Gavin, thoughts on that? It's you know it's a, a, an excellent question, and I think when we looked at that initial contribution waterfall chart, there's obviously the the biggest one of those bars is what your baseline kind Residual, of is. Yeah. But that baseline is something that you've built up through everything you've done over time. I think there was uh, I was asked a similar question about this, particularly once you start to get more and more upper funnel in the channels you're looking at. And this is, I think, the, the ultimate measure of that is how do you measure what happened so many years ago and the, its effect now? So and the, as part of the MMM model, there is uh, something called ad stocking, which measures how long the effect of particular advertising can last for in terms of memory. But I think once we start looking at this buildup of brand equity, we're outside of that. So just to come back to yet another analogy, I like this idea of when you throw a stone in a flat pond, very close to that stone, as you see the ripples come out, it's very easy to see exactly where the stone went in. But as you start to get close to the edge of the pond, and there might be some leaves and some trees or some ducks floating in it, all of those break down the the simplicity of those nice concentric circles radiating outwards. So the more you have in there and the farther you get away from that initial point of impact, then the harder it becomes. If you're just looking at one point at the shore, working at where the rock went in becomes a much more complicated thing to look at. So I think part of what we want to talk about here is with MMM principally, we're looking at channel spends and then a single outcome metric, revenue, sales, lead generation. And this type of question in terms of what does something I did ages ago, what's its effect, is going to be hugely different depending on the buying cycle. If you're looking at buying a new ballpoint pen, that's going to be very different to buying a new car. So I think we have to start thinking about, again, MMM is not the panacea is not the one single solution that you use for measuring your performance. It may well be that we need to start looking at additional data points such as brand lift surveys and just mm -hmm. general understanding awareness. I think um, Jenna can probably speak to those types of uh, KPIs and measurement frameworks better than I, but this idea of we need to really have that measurement framework in place so we can say if we've got additional data points, such as we now know that we've been, because we've been tracking brand awareness and brand lift, we might be able to then focus in on the relationship between leading metrics such as brand awareness versus a lagged metric such as sales and by looking at the period of that lag, we might say, okay, we know that if we drive lift and aware, uh, drive brand awareness here, we will see increased conversion one, two, three, four years down the line. Yeah. So again, it's that idea that MMM isn't the ideal solution for everything, but it's part of it then for those additional data points, having a well-defined measurement framework where you've got leading KPIs that you know correlate strongly with lagging KPIs, which then can focus your upper funnel efforts, for example, on we're now not optimizing towards uh, a conversion metric, we're optimizing towards awareness lift, for example. Yeah, it's the board member versus CEO analogy that, that Dan rolled out earlier, I think is mm -hmm. super appropriate there. So um, we've talked about uh, how it works. We've talked about it, the fact that it is actionable, but it is not a panacea. It, it is not a, an all-knowing oracle, right? It's not the eye of Sauron. But the fact that this is probably not free needs to be taken into consideration. So the myth that it's too expensive has to be viewed through the context of, well, I mean, what's it worth to you, right? Like how much is making fewer mistakes worth to your organization? To some degree, I think that that is based on, well, you know, how, how expensive are your mistakes? And that varies by, by company. Uh, how expensive are your bad guesses? Um, but one of the things that we'll have uh, Gavin touch on here in just a second 
and this is a little bit of a mystery for folks, the cost of doing an MMM implementation isn't necessarily driven by the size of the business. So it, it's not as if big companies have to spend a ton of money and small companies don't. It's not quite that simple because what drives availability and complexity and cost and certainty is, is data and, and how that data is, is structured. Gavin, you want to touch on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it comes back to what we've spoken about repeatedly uh, through this webinar so far, is this idea of what is your objective? What do you want to get out of an MMM? What do you want to action? What, where's the company uh, culture in terms of adopting these data to go on and do the next thing? If you're currently in a place, you could be a huge company. You could be working across multiple markets. You could have a huge ad spend, but if that ad spend is concentrated only on two or three channels and you have just one response metric, say e-commerce, uh, and you're just looking in terms of revenue, you already have a nicely available data source. You've never done an MMM before. So ultimately that incrementally less wrong, it's just a, a dip your toes in the water and just try it out and see what it looks like. The first model doesn't necessarily have to be an all-inclusive, what's every metric and every, both internally and then bringing in third-party metrics from additional data providers to build a super complex model. For the first time you do it, you may not be in a place to really take advantage of the output that that complex a model would, um, would generate. When we start going through the modeling process, one of the things we tend to look at as a metric for the model building process is the same thing if you've ever plotted spend against return on a scatter plot in Excel and drawn the trend line through it. And it's that R squared value. And that tells you how much of the response is determined by what you plug into it. And traditionally we'd look for, or numbers above 80, 90 percent explanation. But that might not necessarily be where you need to start from. It may be understanding 50 percent at a first pass mm -hmm. is still a greater understanding than you had yesterday. And to come back to Dan's incrementally less wrong, then that says, okay, how, what do we need to do to improve this model and be less wrong the next one we run? Exactly. Are we in a position to actually use these data now? So do we need to improve that model and make it the best model it can possibly be? Or is the incremental gain at this point where we are not worth it in terms of the investment for that right. level of modeling? So it becomes a, an iterative process really related to what you're going to action with the output, I think. And certainly you can use a, uh, an exceptional firm like DAC to build out an MMM to start small and certain the way Gavin just advised without trying to build the mother of all MMMs from the first go because you might find that challenging to sort of build it and then get it better over time. But there is certainly a, a school of thought that says you could probably DIY this, right? You could probably build your own MMM. Gavin, as you've uh, talked about uh, with us offline, there are lots of kind of like walkthroughs online that say, here's my blog post about how to make a, a marketing mix model for your organization. Talk about the, the validity or the, the sort of likelihood that someone could pull this off on their own. I think that the likelihood is probably actually quite good. Um, there are, as you mentioned, there are a lot of blog posts you can find and you can download something like RStudio or even go into a, a Google Colab notebook and work in Python. And you can do both of those things for free. You could find code, copy and paste it, in it goes, run the model. I think the issue with that is they're great if they work, but if you don't necessarily start to think about what the role of each step in the process is. What's it there for? When I transform the data like this, what does that do to my model? 
comes down to then how confident are you in what comes out at the other end. So absolutely there, and I would actually encourage people to, to do this because it's actually a, a super interesting way to, to pass a few days in uh, with some with some coding and i think not only that should you then decide to partner with another provider in this it gives you more background and understanding so that the conversations between the two of you can become more engaging more productive and more efficient there are i think with a lot of the um code that you can copy and paste off the net is the model that is the best model to use for your particular data set may not happen to be the one that you've copied and pasted the code for. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this is really starting from, and I think we, this was on a previous slide about how so much of the time and the investment is working with the data and organizing that and exploring it and understanding it in the first place. So going through that initial step to see, is the model that I'm about to apply to these data the most appropriate one that I should use for it is uh, can be a, a very key step in this process. And I think maybe that's where, where some of the knowledge gap can, can sometimes be. Uh, and then, of course, third, there's also the issue that once you get to a particular stage in the process and it throws an error, what yeah. do you do to go about fixing <laughs> yeah. that? Now what? Now what? Which, so which, which I have had you call Gavin. That's what you do. You yeah, call exactly. Gavin. Call Gavin. All right. Last poll, friends. Uh, last poll. Let's try and beat our record for participation here. Uh, obviously, without without uh, data, you don't really have anything. But how much do you need to like make this worth it? Right. So in order to to actually uh, use uh, MMM effectively, how many years do you need? Is it more than five? Is it you know twenty minutes? Uh, what do you think? We'll see if we can beat our participation record here. We're doing great. All right, we'll stop it. Nice job, everybody. Okay, there we go. Share our results. Uh, in this case, it looks like overwhelmingly one to two years uh, mm -hmm. is viewed as the minimum amount of data necessary to create uh, MMM. Three to four years was uh, second place. Nobody said five or more years, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of folks said less than a year. Uh, all right, friends, what uh, what do you think about that? I mean, the myth that we hear is that it requires too much, right? Too much, you know, backwards in order to look forwards. That you need right. too much data to make this work. Um, but you don't necessarily. It's not about volume, right? So, so Dan, talk about this a little bit. Yeah, actually, it's too bad nobody picked your five year. Uh, number because the previous <laughs> question that we got and we talked about residual uh, branding value and residual yeah, advertising yeah, data. Right. Michael, if yeah. you had five years of really clean data, you could tell a terrific story about the long-term impacts of um, upper funnel and brand building activities that happened, you, you know, years prior or compounding. But um, obviously, more is always better um, if you can get it. But the truth is. Uh, it, more in terms of length. Okay, let's clarify some terms. More wide, meaning more sources from every conceivable angle uh, of our socioeconomic and demographic world, um, political events, uh, all of my media, all of my other con uh, supporting metrics. That's more this way. More this way, just meaning if I got two years, three years, four yeah. years of history, um, that one I always find to be give as go as deep as you can um, until we have to redo all kinds of transformational work because you changed systems three years ago and I've got to, hey. it's basically twice the job. Um, but when we do go too wide, we can. It's like trying to go from you know waking up in the morning and going for a sprint right out of the gate. You don't want to do that because you're going to hurt yourself. And as you get older, as you and I both know, um, that that's that you know we're not going to feel good after we do that. Um, and we've we've done some really powerful, useful work with five or six columns of advertising data by week for a year alongside revenue. And okay, now I've got somewhere to start where I can actually put together a bit of a model and Gavin and his team can blend together some coefficients and some uh, and some curvature that gives us something to hand to Jenna's team 
to say, hey, I know you were going to put a plan in for these guys for next year. Um, and whatever you're going to do, bring this into the conversation. And all of a sudden, they're armed with this window of information that they didn't have. And it came from a pretty modest looking spreadsheet. So I, I think it's really important, again, just like expensive is a relative term, more is a relative term. And let's not overcomplicate things out of the gate uh, so that we can you know, let the enemy, uh, let the perfection be the enemy of the great, uh, just to, to, to throw another colloquialism in there. Jenna, have you found that to be the case in, in some of the planning you've done? Yeah, I actually think this third bullet point here is the most important one, right? So a smaller data set, as long as it's the most accurate, most complete, is still superior to a larger, messier, longer term, but less conclusive data set. So I think a lot of times we media people are asked to kind of well, we, we are asked to kind of predict what's going to happen. That's part of our job, certainly. But a lot of times we're asked to do that based on a platform that has changed in between or different measurement models. So everybody now that's on GA is moving into GA4. And we know we only have 18 months of historical data in the same type of measurement. So how has that business taken on their shoulders to make sure that all that data lines up to previous periods to that? So there are a lot of different inputs that can make our outputs dramatically different. And so here I would say this is where the time frame might actually be better to be shorter, depending on what has happened uh, in the past in your business. Right. For, furthermore, I, if I could just add another point, we didn't touch on this much during the expensive myth, um, but the, the cost of the infrastructure and compute and the availability of like super computing power is relatively trivial today than it was even five years ago. So. Um, these things used to be a significant project with a lot of manual effort and a lot of expensive computing power. And they were kind of moment in time things that you would do once every year, every two years. And we're seeing more and more that they're becoming, there's a more regular cadence um, so that these can be kind of operationalized. Uh, so what we find is we operationalize, you know, marketing mix modeling for our clients is we see Every, every time we do it, every cycle, we might add a little bit more. We'll, in, we'll get incrementally more com complex. We'll bring in competitive data. We'll get access to a new column of information that we find, think is relevant and we'll factor that in. So by you know, adopting this type of strategy and bringing it in as part of your media planning uh, cadence and, and, and your business operations generally, you can get it more complicated and more data rich over time without you know blowing blowing your your brains out and and the first go around. Yeah, love that. Well, we have addressed and I think busted five different myths for you here today. The first myth is that MMM is attribution modeling. It is not. We talked about the difference between attribution and contribution. MMM is much more interested in contribution and how media types and spend types work together. The second myth is that MMM tells you how to spend money. It doesn't. It is certainly a, a helper in that question, but there's other tools like return on ad spend and other uh, you know, predictive metrics and even looking backward metrics that you would use in concert to answer that question. The third myth that MMM is interesting, but not actionable. We've certainly dispelled that one. It is highly actionable. In fact, Jenna, Dan, Gavin, and their clients at DAC use it all the time to make better decisions. So it is definitely actionable. The fourth myth is that MMM is too expensive. Again, expense is a relative term, but it is less expensive than ever due to advances in computing power, as Dan just mentioned. Uh, and also, you could, in fact, take it a crack at doing this yourself. So it doesn't have to be expensive. But of course, the real question is, how much is it worth to you to be less wrong? And that depends on your business. And the last myth that we just talked about is that it requires too much data. Well, you might think that more data equals a better model, but the truth is that more accurate data makes a better model. And as Jenna so adroitly pointed out a minute ago, it's the least amount of, of incorrect data is, is what you're looking for. Exactly. So a small, accurate model is better than a large, less accurate model. So it's not about amount of data per se, it's about confidence level of that data. All five of those myths we've addressed, all five of those we have busted. Any comments, friends, before we conclude? Uh, no, thanks for sticking around. Um, again, it's a this can be a super interesting or a bit of a dry topic, depending on what side of the uh, the, the spectrum you live on. But uh, we, we love this stuff and we live it every day. And uh, uh, the truth is, 
again, back to the over, you know, the overarching thesis here is that everybody on the call who is buying media or doing marketing in more than one spot is already making decisions aligned with marketing mix modeling. So arm yourself with as much insight and power as you can the next go around when you do that and start small uh, and work your way from there. And of course, we're here to help uh, at any time uh, for anybody that has is, is on that journey. Thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate your time, your attention. Reminder, we're going to send you the recording. Uh, we're going to send you the slides. We're going to send you uh, the white paper ebook and a bunch of other goodies uh, to give you even more on this exciting topic. Uh, we've got two minutes for questions. Um, I think we've got all of them addressed. Uh, there is definitely some support for the poll-based webinar next time, so we'll have to we'll have to think about that. Nothing, nothing but questions uh, and answers. Uh, Jenna, any questions from you? Do you want to ask a question? I've just answered a question in the Q&A about whether the objective is to make the effective balance of media or if there is an option to increase the budget appropriately. And it is the former. It's the balance of the media. But that could be it, increasing the budget could be a testable hypothesis. So that is one of the things you could look at and say, what would happen? We believe our hypothesis is if we put more money into this area, it will produce better results. And then we can test that and redo the media mix and see how it did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the testing, we didn't hit it that as hard, but if people are talking to you about this sort of stuff and they're not in the same breath talking about a well-designed experiment to test it afterwards, they're not doing the full job. And yeah. like you need to think that way, even if you're DIYing and having a crack at that yourself, what are the experiments you're going to run to help validate uh, your your findings so that you can attack uh, you know use them more confidently. It's really yeah, just assuming that the model is accurate because you made it um, is right. a little bit of a dangerous game. Absolutely, and you know yeah, I don't want to say cor it's correlation does not equal causation for the eight hundredth time in my life, but I'm going to and yeah. you know developing a causal relationship between these things uh, at a, at a macro level is is really what we're going for here at the end yeah. of the day, and you can't do that without testing. Great way to end it. Friends, thank you so much for being here. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today to talk about MMM. Gavin, Jenna, Dan, appreciate you as always. We'll see okay. you all next time. Thanks so much, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone.